All right, looks like we have most people out of the waiting room and into our event. Hi, everyone. My name is Nari, and I'm with the Congressman's Office. I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before we begin, I'm going to go over a few details of today's event. On the agenda for today, the Congressman will start with some opening remarks. And after that, we will go into a few frequently asked questions that were submitted beforehand. From there, we will go into live questioning. If you would like to ask a question in regards to this topic today, please first ask your question using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. When you do so, please include your name and the town you are from. We may have a few people on this call with the same name, so it's very important that you include your name and the town you are from as well, so we can give you a little shout out. Um, if you have a question in regards to an individual issue with a federal agency, that's something like with the IRS or Social Security Administration or FEMA, we ask that you please refrain from sharing any personal information and that you instead ask your question on our casework form online at malinowski.house.gov slash casework. I just dropped that link in the chat feature right now. We will not be taking any individual casework questions on this call today. I will always let you know if you are the next questioner, I'll shoot you a chat uh, and unmute you. So when your time comes, you'll be able to ask your question to Tom. I'll go over this process a few times uh, before we begin the live Q&A portion as well. And just to note that this call is being recorded for distribution purposes, so if you would like to turn off your camera, please feel free to do so. And let's get started. The Congressman will start with some opening remarks. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Nari. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tom from Ringo's, in case there are any other Toms. Uh, and it's great to, uh, to be here with you to talk about something that's happening in our economy right now uh, and what we're doing about it, uh, including a big piece of legislation that I just got uh, or helped get through the, the House of Representatives. Um, what's happening in a nutshell, and this is uh, the part of economics that's pretty simple, is that people have a lot of money to spend, which is a really good thing, especially when you think about what happened in our economy uh, after COVID, but that money is chasing too few things. Um, and the result is that we're experiencing inflation, disruptions, anxiety, uh, and all the stuff that, uh, that you see being discussed uh, in the papers every single day. Um, good news, but also bad news. And our job is to try to do something about these problems, these disruptions, so we can uh, enjoy the prosperity that the good policies of the last few years uh, have given us. The fundamental problem, I think, is uh, one that has its roots well beyond, well before the, the pandemic. Um, for many years, we are all aware of this. We have allowed and in some cases encouraged the, the shifting the movement of manufacturing overseas, away from the United States, um, manufacturing and the jobs that go with manufacturing. Um, and over time, the private sector has uh, developed these literally global supply chains um, with a system of just-in-time delivery, keeping inventories as low as possible, relying on uh, sophisticated logistics to ensure that Every time we, we get out of bed and get on Amazon and order something, uh, that thing is, uh, is, has just been produced in anticipation of our needs. Uh, and uh, there is a ship uh, or train uh, or truck uh, ready to bring it uh, to a warehouse near our house and to our door uh, in a way that all seems incredibly, incredibly easy. It's a system that works when it works. But as we saw in this pandemic, in a crisis that um, disrupts any aspect of the system, and this one disrupted multiple aspects of the system, it breaks down very easily and it makes us very, very vulnerable. Um, we saw that, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic with PPE. Um, most of our masks and gowns and simple things that we needed to stay safe made overseas, many, much of it in China. And, and suddenly the entire world is hit by a pandemic and demand for all that stuff spikes everywhere, including in China. And so understandably, they started using the stuff that they would normally be exporting to us 
and we were scrounging in Hunterdon County and Somerset County for the most basic things that we needed to stay safe. Uh, we've dealt with the PPE shortage, but we're still experiencing all kinds of other disruptions. There's still factories overseas that are shut down because workers are sick. They're not, you know, not enough workers are able to come to their jobs. Uh, ports have been hit. Uh, trucking has been hit. Uh, every stage of the, the logistics chain uh, has been uh, has been hit. Um, and as a result, uh, not only uh, you know are deliveries sometimes delayed, um, but we're seeing a shortage of critical uh, of materials and, and technological components that are critical to um, how our economy works. Um, an obvious example that, that you've read and heard a lot about is semiconductors. Um, the United States used to produce something like 36, 37 percent of the world's uh, semiconductors. We're down to about 13 percent today, but actually it's zero percent of the most sophisticated semiconductors um, that are used in th everything from our phones to increasingly our cars. The average electrical vehicle has about 2,000 uh, microchips uh, in it. The average gas-powered vehicle, about 700 microchips. Um, and demand for chips in the United States is, is increasing uh, much more quickly than the supply. Most of the highly sophisticated microchips right now are produced in Taiwan. Uh, it's a friend of the United States, close relationship, democratic country. But uh, as we all know, it's also highly threatened by the People's Republic of China. And God forbid that there should be a war. We're working to prevent it. But if, uh, if China invades Taiwan, uh, not only is that a humanitarian disaster, but suddenly the, the, the Communist Party of China controls the, uh, almost the entirety of the world's supply of advanced microchips. So again, another vulnerability that market economics doesn't really um, account uh, for. Um, and it's not just microchips, of course, um, solar panels. About um, half of the key ingredient that's, that's, that's used to make solar panels, a material called polysilicone, comes not just from China, but from the, the Xinjiang region of China, which is where the genocide is taking place, where hundreds of thousands of people are um, being held in slave labor camps. We want solar panels, we want solar energy. We don't wanna have to depend on slave labor for goodness sakes to be able to, to move in that direction. Pharmaceutical ingredients, about 90% of the, the uh, generic um, active pharmaceutical ingredients that our pharmaceutical companies used uh, come from overseas or manufactured overseas. China and India control a huge share of the supply chain for those. Uh, rare earth middle, minerals, like for example, cobalt, which is a critical ingredient in battery technology, something else that's incredibly important to the direction that we want to move in as an economy and, and as a country. Um, uh, we used to, the United States used to be uh, the leading producer of rare earth minerals. Today, China mines about 55% of them or controls the mining of about 55% of them and controls the refining of about 85% of them. And then battery technology itself, the batteries themselves, demand, uh, global demand is skyrocketing and production in the United States is stagnating. And that's something that um, I think needs to change. Um, now, I, I'm a capitalist. I'm a believer in free markets, but I also think that there is a role for government, and there always has been in modern American history, a role for government uh, in, um, in, in paying for research and development, and also jumpstarting production and manufacturing in industries that we decide as a country are critical to our security and to our economy. Um, there are a lot of examples of this. The internet, obviously, like that, that arose out of an investment and out of work that the Defense Department uh, did in the 1970s uh, and the 1980s. The GPS system was developed by the US government, by the Defense uh, Department. It is still controlled essentially by the Department of Defense. Our entire economy, it, it, it relies on the GPS system right now 
um, to function. Semiconductors, the, the whole semiconductor industry, which used to be huge in the United States, arose out of investments that the federal government made actually during the Second World War. Um, the COVID vaccine, a very recent uh, example uh, of this, um, and very relevant to what we're trying to do today. Last big financial crisis in 2009, um, Congress set up uh, something called the Advanced Technological uh, Vehicles Manufacturing Program. Um, it was a program that gave out loans and loan guarantees to private manufacturers to stimulate the, the, the production of, of clean energy vehicles, electrical vehicles, and to create jobs in that way, to help our economy in that way. Uh, there was a, a company that uh, was producing in, two, in 2010 um, a very expensive high-end sports electric vehicle. Um, very few people were buying it. And this company got a, a loan of about $465 million from the federal government under this program. Um, three years later, Tesla paid that loan back with interest. Taxpayers made money off of this. And it's now one of the biggest and uh, most successful companies, not just in the United States and the world. Um, so that background is the model for what we're trying to do today. Um, last week in the House, we passed a bill called the America Competes Act. Um, it is a companion to a similar bill in the United States Senate. Um, this bill is basically uh, designed to ensure that we can keep up in this competition with China, with other countries, and more importantly, that we can bring some of these supply chains, particularly for critical materials and goods and products back to the United States, or at least closer to the United States, so we're not as vulnerable as we have been in this crisis uh, if and when a future crisis arises. Um, one element of the bill is huge investment in domestic manufacturing of advanced uh, microchips. Uh, there was an earlier bill called the CHIPS Act, which we were incorporating, we're funding uh, through this bill. Um, the other big part is the part that I wrote. Um, I, I sat down uh, starting several months ago um, with a small group of folks uh, in the House, particularly uh, Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger, and we we worked on something that would be bipartisan, uh, that would be uh, that would be acceptable to uh, the business community as well as to uh, labor unions. And after a lot of work, we we came up with something that again passed the House uh, last week. And what it it will do, in addition to the investment in microchip manufacturing, is to create uh, an office at the Department of Commerce. Um, that will be uh, responsible for 24-7 for monitoring of supply chains in this country so that it can detect vulnerabilities before they hit us hard. And uh, we give this office $45 billion over five years to invest in grants, loans, and loan guarantees, like that one that we made to Tesla back in 2010, to domestic manufacturers to, to, again, bring home manufacturing and supply chains for, um, for industrial goods, uh, technologies, and materials that are designated as critical to our national security and to our economic security. Um, so this is where we are. Um, this piece of it is not in the Senate bill. So what we now have is an old fashioned conference between the House and the Senate. This is kind of how a bill is supposed to become a law, regular order. Um, and I'll be working very, very hard with my colleagues over the next, hopefully three or four weeks uh, to try to reconcile differences between these two bills and hopefully get this uh, to the president's desk soon with all of those important uh, pieces in place. Um, I am very confident we're going to get a bill to the president's desk. This is not one of those deals where we pass something in the House that we love and it goes to die in the Senate. Again, remember, the Senate has already passed its own version of this bill. And it was very bipartisan in the Senate. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm confident once we work out the differences and the details, this is going to be a big win. It'll be a huge win for America. 
It'll be a huge win for New Jersey. We have an innovation economy in, in the state. Um, there's no question there are going to be a lot of small to medium-sized companies that can take advantage of loans and loan guarantees under this program to become um, the Teslas of, of the future. And um, that's good for them, good for us, good for our country, good for our state, and look forward to being a part of it with you in the coming years. Thanks again. Thanks, Tom. I'm happy to take questions or, uh, or thoughts. Great. All right, we are going to begin a few frequently asked questions that were submitted beforehand. And after that, we will go into live questions from you all. If your pre-submitted question is not answered today in the FAQ portion, please ask again in the chat feature for it to be answered live today. And just a reminder, if you would like to ask a live question, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and I will add you to the list of questioners, include your name and the town you are from as well. Now would be a great time for you to start submitting your questions. And just to begin with some FAQs, Tom, you may have touched upon these, but they're at the top of everyone's mind. So we may have to reiterate a few things as well. But Tom, how will your bill help consumer prices? Uh, so it is. this is absolutely one of the most practical things that we can do uh, to deal with the supply chain inflation that we're experiencing in, uh, in our economy today. Um, again, the fundamental reason for increasing prices is that we have a lot of money to spend. Uh, we were able to get through the pandemic without becoming destitute uh, as a country. Um, but the supply chains, for all the reasons that I mentioned, um, in part because of our over-dependence on global supply chains, uh, have not recovered fast enough. So I don't want to suggest this is an instant cure, by the way, if we pass this bill tomorrow, um, it doesn't mean that meat prices or, or car prices are going to come down uh, immediately. Uh, but, you know, take, for example, uh, uh, cars. Uh, about 30% of the inflation that we are increasing, that, sorry, that we are experiencing right now um, can be accounted for by the automotive market, new and used cars. That is almost entirely a function of the shortage of microchips. Um, so, uh, you know, if we can get this done uh, quickly, uh, I think you're going to see over the next year or two a very significant rebound in the U.S. Uh, in, in U.S. production uh, and and close to the United States production of advanced microchips, which is absolutely going to bring the the cost of cars and used cars down. That's just uh, that's just one uh, example. Thanks, Tom. All right, let's take one more FAQ and then we already have some questions rolling in. So Tom, next, what can consumers do to help ease the problem? I, you know, it's, this is, this is not mostly on us as consumers. Um, there's nothing wrong with consumers wanting to buy stuff. Uh, we, we worked really hard during the economic shutdowns and the pandemic to try to keep our economy going so, uh, so that folks um, could continue to uh, pay their bills and give their families and their kids not just what they, uh, what they need, but what they want. Um, but I think one thing we can all do and it would be a good thing to do under any circumstances where possible, try to shop locally. You know, I, I've tried to do my Christmas shopping um, uh, locally in, in the little towns of the seventh district on the main streets where we have wonderful shops, wonderful local manufacturers and producers and farmers. Um, and, you know, kind of get over that habit as, as convenient as it is, as easy as it is, to just go online and order stuff from Amazon. I'm, I'm guilty, I do it. Uh, it's often the, you know, the easiest way to do it, but wherever possible, um, go shop in your local Main Street. Uh, you'll be helping out your neighbors, you'll be helping out local small business owners, and you'll also be easing that massive pressure uh, at our ports, uh, on our trucking system, on our logistics system, uh, I mean, it's actually amazing if you look at the statistics. One reason we're having these shutdowns in our ports is that people are actually, we're ordering a lot more online 
today than we were before the pandemic. It's not just that spending has returned to previous levels. We're spending more and we're spending a lot more of what we earn um, on online deliveries. And a lot of that um, basically, you know, when you hit purchase, what you're doing is you're triggering a supply chain that begins in China, that begins in India, that begins overseas, that involves um, uh, a cargo container and a ship uh, and cranes at the port of Long Beach or the port of New York, New Jersey, trucking, warehouses, all the stuff that's under strain. And um, again, we can't, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we, that we uh, get rid of that system, which has brought us incredible convenience and prosperity, but we can in our personal lives, I think, make more of an effort uh, to go to downtown Clinton and downtown Westfield and downtown Chester and, uh, and shop from our, from our neighbors. Thanks, Tom, great answer. Let's uh, start doing some live questions. Again, if you have a question for the Congressman today, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Let me know your name and the town you are from and I will add you to our queue. To start off, we have John from Flanders. John, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Um, I've been in supply chain since the 90s. I've done a lot of global solutions and I want to expand a little bit and then ask you a question. So in the United States, we've lost a lot of manufacturing uh, ability. Uh, so certainly um, work I'm doing in high performance compute right now is very, very reliant upon the latest uh, microchips. And um, to gain that back, Intel is making a big investment. Uh, I'm sad to say that we're not getting much in New Jersey. And we should because we were one of the inventors of the transistor in New Jersey. So um, I, I would like to help if I possibly could with maybe helping you describe things that New Jersey has abilities to do. Um, in my experience, I was working in U.S. metals. It was the last copper refinery in New Jersey, which closed in the 1980s. And um, we've lost that to overseas as well. So I think there's two aspects. You touched upon one, which is the need for the ability to manufacture for ourselves those goods that we deem to be critical and innovative. But the second part is um, I've studied the whole global supply chain and I believe there's a number of policies that the United States government needs to quickly modernize. The whole concept of how we deal with the uh, transportation at the trucking and rail level has not been modernized. And one of the big uh, deficiencies I've seen in the California ports specifically, they're very landlocked, right? California's real estate is very expensive. So there hasn't been any investment by California. In fact, it's been the inverse. And we've had state um, requirements that basically limit the national supply chain because of differences of opinion. So no one disagrees with California that they shouldn't have a clean environment. Right. Well, many of the policies at the state level, which then block the federal level, they're just not in concert. So yeah. could you speak about beyond the manufacturing, which I think you're doing a good job with, um, we need to also figure out the balance of supply chain, the logistics of getting uh, ships to, to trucks and trucks to distribution points. Yeah. And that I think is a key thing that should be added to this bill. Well, I'm, um, you know, uh, this is something uh, I can tell you know more about than I do. Uh, I am, uh, uh, I'll, I'll admit, I'm, you know, I'm talking to experts. I'm, I'm, I'm getting uh, smarter on this, uh, but I'm never going to be as smart as somebody who's spent their entire life in in supply chains and logistics. So I'm, I really appreciate that you're on the call. Um, in terms of our ports, uh, I, you know, I've. I forgot to mention, but we did pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill last year. And one of the, the big line items in that bill was uh, in investment in modernizing uh, our, our ports. We, um, our, our ports are much more labor intensive than, uh, than some of the more modern ports in, in Europe, for example. Uh, there's a lot more we can do with technology to 
make things more efficient. Um, you know, I've talked to folks at the port of uh, uh, New York, New Jersey, which by the way, never experienced the almost, but never experienced the, the problem with ships lined up uh, uh, for, for days and weeks that we saw off of uh, the California ports. Uh, and, you know, they were telling me nightmare stories about, um, about the, the, the shippers basically dumping their containers at the port. So they'll bring in a full container from Asia or Europe or someplace else. It's unloaded and then they just leave the container. Um, and so the containers pile up and up and up. And there's, as you said, there's not enough real estate uh, to be able to accommodate all of that. So that's a problem we have to, uh, we have to solve. Um, I'm a huge believer in our rail network. I'm on the transportation infrastructure uh, committee. Uh, and um, again, that's one of the big things that we were investing in, uh, in that infrastructure bill um, is our national rail network, uh, including the, um, the, the bridges and tunnels that the federal government basically is responsible for that enable that network to, uh, to function. Um, and then there are more complicated issues that I'd love to hear more from you about in terms of harmonizing state and federal uh, regulations. Uh, no question that, that things get uh, way too complicated when you have 50 state governments plus a federal government all trying to, um, uh, uh, to get their, uh, you know, to get their views um, about how things should happen into, uh, into law. So uh, if there's stuff that needs to be cleaned up, uh, I'd love to have you talk to my staff uh, a bit more and, and give us the guidance that, that we need. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, John. John, I'll reach out to you so we can get your contact information so we can stay connected as well. Very good. Thanks. Next up, we have John from New Providence. John, can you hear us? I can. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, Tom, for, for setting this up. This is really great to have a chance to speak with you directly. Hey, I, I've got a question and, and I enjoyed the last uh, question as well. Um, I'm in supply chain as, as, as well. And so it's nice to see some other supply chain folks out here. But um, I'm in pharmaceuticals and probably 90%, as John mentioned, of my material or raw material come out of India, China or Turkey it's all overseas yeah. and it's been very, very problematic for us to, to just have the raw material that we need to make life-saving medicines. And, and fortunately it's worked out pretty well for us, right? It's taken a lot of work, but we've been able to keep our production up and running. My, my question for you is more, more macroeconomic, right? Because when I look at China or again, or Turkey, just kind of picking some of the big ones, India, it turns out that a lot of that processing for a lot of our raw materials, it's just cheaper there. The fundamentals of it's cheaper. Um, and, you know, they don't have the same kind of EPA guidelines that we have here in the US. And I believe China and India are more becoming more conscientious about the environment, which is really helpful. But at the end of the day, it's just cheaper to buy it there. I can't even buy a lot of what I want out of the US because these companies that used to produce it have just dried up and gone away. And so when I think about the EPA guidelines, when I think about, you know, for example, energy, because it drives a lot of this, right? So if we think about, you know, the North Star gas pipeline being approved, but the Keystone pipeline being shut down. And for me, it's really not a binary question around, do I like the environment or not? Because I think we all do but it really comes down to how do I try to keep our doors open and get the right type of material and hopefully buy it you know, from, from a manufacturer here in the US. I just love to hear you talk a little bit about how do we find the right balance yeah. between regulation and, and promoting manufacturing here? Thank you. Uh, it's a really good question to which obviously there's not a simple answer. Um, I, I support environmental regulations. It's an easy thing to say, right? It's a very generic thing to say. I, I wanna make sure that the air that I breathe is clean in New Jersey. I wanna make sure that the water that we drink is safe. And uh, we've made a lot of progress as a country since uh, 
when, when I, I came to America in 1971 as a six-year-old kid, and, you know, there were pollution blackout days in New York City and um, rivers on fire and all that stuff. And we, we've come a long way. We don't want to go back there. But at the same time, I know that uh, there are layers of overlapping regulations that sometimes um, don't make a lot of sense. And I think that's what you're talking about when, when you refer to the need for a balance. Um, I think the question, and in a way, it's a question back for you, is is you know, whether through investments in research and development, more advanced technology, um, we can uh, improve the productivity of manufacturing in the United States and diminish its environmental impacts to the point where we can do this just as inexpensively if you take into account you know, transportation costs as an overseas supplier, but also in a much higher quality way from, from the standpoint of health and safety and, and the environment. My hope is that the answer to that question is yes, but that's also where the government comes in, right? If you're a, if you're a private sector company, are you gonna make those steep upfront investments in improving productivity and quality and efficiency and environmental sensitivity of what you're doing um, if at any moment you know any of your competitors can undercut you by not making those investments and this is why historically it has been government investment in r d um, and government being willing to risk capital um, to help companies that are willing to make those investments that has moved us leaps and bounds in, into the future and and so i think that's what we're trying to do here one more point on this you know, um, the, the free, you know, free market thinking tells us that it, it really, it, it shouldn't matter where something is produced because people are always going to want to make money, whether, you know, China and India, Russia, and no matter what types of governments rule these countries, no matter what uh, our relationship with those governments may be, they're always going to want to get rich and sell us things. And I'm, I'm a little worried that we're heading into a period in global affairs. And now this is, this is the stuff that I may be a little more expert on, um, where that's not necessarily something we can count on. We, we, we could be in a, um, in a really sticky situation with Russia this year if Putin decides to invade Ukraine, for example. And already we've seen Russian companies that supply Europe with energy start turning the spigots off, even though it costs them a lot of money, because it is the national policy of Russia to try to punish these countries for helping Ukraine. Um, I mentioned the horrific prospect of China trying to take back Taiwan and the impact that that might have on supply chains for advanced microchips. Um, this, is, this is a dangerous period in geopolitics and I think that's another strong argument for trying to bring at least some of these supply chains home. Um, again, particularly for things that are essential to our economic and national security. Thank Completely you. agree with you. Yeah, great, great, uh, great thoughts. I agree with you. And I, I hope we can find a place where there's an economic incentive to produce here in the US, um, but I, I agree with you. I, I hope we can find the right investment and the right folks to start these up. Thank you, appreciate that. Stay, stay in touch with us and, and fingers crossed if we pass this bill, uh, like I really do expect there are gonna be a lot of folks in our part of New Jersey, a lot of companies that are gonna wanna try to take advantage of these opportunities and, and I'm gonna wanna work with, you know, if there's anyone on this call in that category, I'm gonna wanna work with you to make sure that, that you can do that. Absolutely. And if uh, you feel like we would benefit from having your contact information, just reach out uh, using that chat feature, shoot um, me a message with your email and our office um, will continue to be in contact with you. And thanks, John, for your question. Next up, we have Kevin from Branchburg. Kevin, can you hear us? Yes, I could. Could you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead with your yeah. question. 
Yeah, thanks, Tom. Appreciate you uh, sharing your information. Uh, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but it's a lot of long-term solutions, it seems like. And I own a small business. And a lot of the part shortages we're seeing here are because of what we feel are the personnel shortages. We lost people during COVID because they got paid more not to work. And a lot of the people we buy some products from, you know, subcomponents can't supply us products because they're short of workers. Uh, the trucking companies are complaining that they can't st get stuff moved around because they're short of workers. Um, I know like, it seems like the states like New York finally stopped allowing uh, renters to not pay rent without the, uh, the choice of maybe being evicted. Um, it seems like there's still subsidies being paid to people not to work. I know the extra bonuses are at least finally gone and that helped a little bit, but what's being done by the government about that to try to get workers to actually work again and not just stay home? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, well, you're hitting the nail on the head. That's in the short run, probably the most acute problem that we face. And I hear it from every small business owner, not just small businesses, but particularly small business owners I talk to. Uh, I really, Kevin, I really don't think that at this point, it's it, that, that, that the government paying people not to work is the main problem because almost all that stuff that we did in the worst months of the pandemic has, has now expired. Um, the, 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 most obvious example was the enhanced unemployment benefits mm -hmm. um, that people were able to uh, get for an extended period of time. That's That's been done now for many, many months. Uh, we're not doing stimulus payments. Um, you know, there are still some protections. Uh, you mentioned the, the renters thing in New York City, but that's, that's not an economy-wide uh, issue. We don't, uh, you know, we, we, we don't even have the um, the protections for sick leave that we that we put in place during the pandemic, which you know is a problem for um, for a lot of you know lower income workers and mm -hmm. professions like healthcare who cannot work from home, and you know they're still getting sick for five or ten days at a time. But anyway, they're not getting it. So um, so much has been said and written about this. The Great Resignation. A lot of people retired. Early people who are close to retirement just said, you know, I'm fed up. I'm going to uh, take my savings and leave the workforce. Um, let's not forget we lost 900,000 Americans. There are 900,000 fewer Americans. And, and yes, many of them were retired, but many of them were not retired um, who lost their lives during the COVID pandemic. Um, so how do we, how do we solve it? Um, I got to tell you, I think the, 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 the single thing that government could do that would have the most immediate and profound impact is something that is politically really sensitive right now and has been for, for some years. Uh, and that's immigration reform. I mean, we've got more than 10 million people in the United States who want desperately to work and to be taxpayers and to be stakeholders in, in this society, but they broke the law in coming to this country, which creates a dilemma because we are a rule of law country and we don't want to incentivize that. But, um, but given what's happening in the economy right now, given what almost every business owner I speak to tells me, I, I really think that there is not just a humanitarian argument for for some kind of immigration reform that allows more people to work legally, that allows small business owners to legally hire more people. I think that the, the, our self-interested argument for that right now is about as high as it's, as it's ever been. Um, and again, that would be immediate. Yeah, but it, it seems so that, I mean, that two years ago, we had the same immigration rules in place. Hmm. And now it's, I mean, companies are 25 to 50% short of people, depending on what type of company it is. So the 900,000 right. unfortunately passed away can't be all that problem. I mean, it's just that people aren't working. Well, that we don't working have 50% fewer people in the labor force. Totally. Um, I mean, you know, and, and you've seen the unemployment statistics. We, you've seen the I mean, the job numbers in the last three or four, the, the job growth numbers, the, the, the growth in the 
number of people in America who have full-time employment in the last three or four months has been absolutely stunning. Um, they've had to go back and revise the numbers from, uh, you know, from like September, October, November that weren't as uh, as great initially. So again, I, I know I know what many small business owners are are facing, but economy wide, we are adding jobs and adding people who are working uh, every single day and every single week. But we did have some people who um, who who disappeared from the workforce, um, some because they're no longer with us, others because they resigned, they, they retired two or three years early. Um, in other words, there are people who are probably not going to get back. And, you know, and that does have a disruptive impact. You take two or 3% of the workforce out in, in such a short period of time, and the, the, the disruption is more than two or 3% in terms of the impact on the economy. So, um, you know, again, I, I, I hear you, but I don't think at this point, and I supported ending the unemployment benefits for this reason, but I, I don't think there's that much more we can do to, you know, I, do, I don't think it's that people have a government benefit-based incentive right now to stay at home. I, I don't see that happening. You know, even the child tax credit, which is something I, uh, I strongly support it has now expired because the Senate didn't allow us to, uh, to renew it. So I, I just, I don't, I don't think it's that. It just seems hard to believe that, I mean, like you go to the Bridgewater mall, mm -hmm. stores are closing early because they don't have people to come and work there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a massive impact. So I can't picture it. People can't be just staying at home, not getting any income coming in and being able to pay their bills. So it yeah. seems like either the bills are being paid for or they're still getting income someplace for not working. Well, yep. Yeah, also, a lot of, you know, another thing that happened is that we gave tens of millions of people in America a six month paid vacation. Yeah. Right. And it's not that they're still on a paid vacation, but they used that six months to do what they normally would never have had time to do which is to think about what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. Do I want to be a, you know, uh, do I want to be a dishwasher uh, at um, a restaurant where I'm working until midnight every night for $12 an hour when I now realize I can get a warehouse job that pays $22 an hour? Uh, or my buddy recruited me to work uh, in, in his landscaping firm for, $20 an hour, right? So there's also been a lot of people who've decided to change their, uh, their path, um, right. whether it's going back to school, getting training, getting a higher paying job, wages are going up, of course, in a lot of in industries, that's part of inflation. So that also happened. And, you know, for those workers, that's a really good thing. You know, you can't dispute it. Right. It just means that you know, if you're that restaurant owner, you still, you're now struggling to find a dishwasher. Right. right. And, and this is where I come back to, if we're looking for entry level workers in the economy, I think we have to be more pragmatic about immigration. Okay. Thanks, thank Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Tom. Tom, just some clarification on uh, one thing you also mentioned we have here in the chat. You said workers want better jobs. What do you mean by that? Well, I think we all want that. Like all of us would like to have more rewarding jobs with better hours and better pay. And I think all of us have experienced um, what it's like to have incredibly demanding jobs in terms of hours where you just don't have time to think about your next step. You might say, I don't love this job. I'd like to have something better, but you're coming home every night tired and you've got kids and you gotta make sure that they're fed and that they go to school the next morning. You don't have time to think about how to achieve that next step in your life um, or to take some of the steps that we sometimes need to take in terms of more education and training, networking, that's required for that. And as I said, we gave every American a six month paid vacation to do all those things. And a lot of folks took advantage of it. And 
in the short term, and you know, we're still talking a year or two, it's very short term, um, that has created a lot of disruptions that we are adjusting to. And I think that's, you know, it, it's the good news, bad news combination that, that we, we should be um, we should be thinking about. Um, inflation is a combination of, it, 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 it is good news meeting bad news. Good news is that we came out of the pandemic not destitute. We came out of the pandemic um, on average with more household savings than we had before. It's the first economic crash in American history in which we could say that. That is an amazingly good thing. And I disagree with people who say we shouldn't have done that. I'm glad we did it. Um, the bad news is that all that money that we now want to spend is chasing too little stuff. And that's created a very real problem that has wiped out the value of some of the added income that we're getting. And the people like me, public officials, have an absolute moral responsibility to try to address. We have to solve that problem. And that's, you know, the supply chain bill is one aspect of that, at least in the mid to longer term. Thanks, Tom. All right, we have time for just a few more questions here. So again, if you do have a question for Tom, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and I'll queue you up for your question. Next up, we have Walter from Bridgewater. Walter, can you hear us? Yes. Go hey, ahead Walter. with your question. Walter, do we have you? There you go. Are you unmuted? Yes. Go ahead with your question. I was curious if any parts of this are coming from or assisting, however you want to put it, the Build Back Better. Um, I think mm, overlap is a better word. Yeah. I mean, there's, I would say, yes, there's, there's <laughs> overlap. Like, you know, um, if we're trying to bring manufacturing back, to America, if we're trying to build infrastructure as we did in the infrastructure bill, it would be very helpful uh, to have better and more affordable childcare in America, right? Because that's, uh, and by the way, I should have mentioned that uh, in my response to Kevin about the labor shortage. That's, that's also, I think, a factor for some, for some, uh, for some folks. Uh, if you've got kids at home, it, it, it just becomes harder to, um, uh, with you know, with the shortage of childcare, with the expense, and in 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 New Jersey, typical family with two kids, uh, two toddlers, uh, trying to put them in childcare, spending about twenty six thousand dollars. You know, this is that is a cost of going back to work, right, for those people, and so that's something that we we had hoped to address in the Build Back Better bill, and and of course we've been frustrated. We're going to keep on trying. To pass the individual pieces of uh, of that bill, and I think again, that's a good example of something that that interacts with, that works with all of the other things that we're trying to do. I was asking what you was there anything you pulled into your bill? Oh, from Build Back Better? Yeah. No, no, this is entirely separate. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Walter. All right, let's go to Chris from Flemington. Chris, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. It's this is so important. Um, I'm a huge proponent of getting chip manufacturing back here. Okay. So reduce regulations in addition to less expensive labor and government investment all drove the chip manufacturing out of this country. Okay. Good, bad, or otherwise, that's what happened. Mike you're addressing the investment piece, which is critical, okay? Um, my concern or my question for you is, how are we gonna do, and, and I guess this was touched upon a little bit, I, my apologies for the redundancy, but so that we don't get the regulation people and the bureaucracy in the way of having this become successful. Um, and then the second part of it is I'm not saying cheap labor, but there's less expensive labor offshore. How are we going to compete with that less expensive labor? You know, we're, we're making this investment, or we will if it all gets passed, but I'm worried about regulations and I'm worried about 
um, being able to actually compete from a labor cost standpoint? Yeah. So uh, on labor, um, you know, I just went into some of that in depth. I, I think, you know, traditionally we've competed with greater productivity, which comes from investments in technology. Like we will never have labor as cheap in the United States as in Honduras or in Vietnam or uh, India at, at this stage of their development. And we don't want our labor to be that cheap, right? You couldn't live in America on those wages. But where we can, where, where we make up for it, at least in part, is technology that makes an American worker vastly more productive. And I think that brings me back to the investment piece of, of the bill, because um, the purpose of this office that we are creating in the Department of Commerce is to look at these industries where we want to bring home manufacturing. And it's not every industry. We don't have to make every toaster in America, right? We're, we're talking about about stuff that's much more fun than batteries, you know, where it's so critical to where we want to go as a as an economy. Look at each of these industries. What 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 is needed to be able to make it in America, to be able to make it in New Jersey. And it, it could be inventory, right? It could be investments in um, uh, in that that manufacturers uh, can use to store up in inventory to to be able to deal with disruptions that, like the ones that we've faced today. It could be technology that makes their workforce more productive so that they can compete against that cheap labor in 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 other countries. Um, it could be any number of things, but the point of this office is going to be to figure out with industry what that is and to provide some of the upfront investments to make it possible, which in time, many of which will be paid back with interest, right? So the fact that we're giving this office $45 billion does not necessarily mean that 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 we're, we're adding $45 billion in debt, right? That Tesla loan, we made money off of it 10 years ago. So that's the idea. Um, so that's number one, productivity. Number two, this is what I was saying uh, in, in answer to the previous question, we have to expand the size of the workforce in the United States. Um, expand the size of the qualified workforce, and that's a function of training, um, not just you know, moving away from a system where everyone absolutely has to have a four-year degree from a liberal arts college right, to get a job, and more to, towards more of a skills-based system where there are a lot of other ways to get the skills to qualify to work in that advanced chip factory uh, or, or what have you. Um, and again, expand the size of the workforce, which I, I want to, you know, again, this, this is controversial in our politics, but I strongly feel that immigration, legal immigration is really good for our economy for, for this reason, um, especially for those entry level jobs as Americans move up the, the, the chain. And then regulations, um, you know, this is where, uh, you know, this is probably where, you know, if there are any Republicans on the call, you're looking at me, a Democrat, and saying, you know, this is where you're on, this is where you're weakest, right? And, and it's true, like, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the party that, that has supported um, stricter environmental regulations and health and safety regulations. In, in the balance of our debate in America, that's the role that we played as Democrats. And, and I would totally acknowledge that, that although the intentions I think are very, very good, and we're, we're better and healthier and safer as Americans as a result, that the layers of bureaucracy that have been created between the state and federal levels are a problem for people who are in business and trying to create jobs. And so it's, you know, it's a constant tension. And um, all I can say is one reason why I talk to business owners, why we have these forums, um, I'm always open to uh, good ideas for eliminating those uh, all of that overlap and redundancy and trying to do things in a simpler way. Less paperwork, less red tape. I know it's easy to say, but that's an invitation to everybody on this call to come and tell me your, your favorite regulation that, that should be uh, uh, <laughs> dealt with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Tom. All right, we're going to try to get to one more questioner here. And we have Mark from Frenchtown. Mark, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead, with your, 
Go out with your question. Mark, do we have you? California has no water, but produces vegetables, milk, and dairy products. How much is the federal government subsidizing California? New York State and Northeastern states have water in contrast. Is California building desalination plants and who pays? Uh, I don't I don't know about the desalination plants. I should, but uh, that's a good good question. Uh, your critique is right. Um, we, uh, you know, and I think this, when we talk about, about buying more locally, that's not just in the United States as against ordering everything from Amazon. It's also about buying things closer to where we live. And, you know, I live in Hunterdon County we have absolutely wonderful agriculture. We, you know, um, why would I want to buy a vegetable that's trucked all the way across the country that was grown in a farm in California when New um, Jersey has lots of farms? I've got neighbors who who you know who grow much better tomatoes than anything. You I've betcha, done, right? And so that's also on us, like we as consumers. The, I mean, the reason California does that is because we buy it. Um, and it's more convenient. And we got used to as Americans having every agricultural product at every, in every season of the year, right? As against what our, you know, my grandparents and great grandparents would shop seasonally. Um, so I'm not saying, you know, again, I don't believe in the nanny state. I don't believe the government should say you can't have your, your tomatoes in the winter. Um, but uh, but we as consumers can make those choices. And if we do, the, the market will respond to our choices and, and our neighbor farmers uh, in our part of New Jersey will do, uh, will do even better. And that's, that's great for, for everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Mark. And we are nearing the end of our conversation today. If we didn't get to your question that you submitted today, we are more than happy to uh, take it on using our forum on our website. I just put that link in the chat feature right now. It's malinowski.house.gov slash contact. And with that, uh, thanks everyone for joining today's conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tom for some closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, uh, this week I've, I've done two of these uh, town halls that are focused on a specific issue. We did one on Ukraine um, a couple of days ago because I was just there with a bipartisan delegation. Uh, we did today's discussion. I really love doing this. Um, uh, when I did the Ukraine one, I was probably the, the expert in the room. Uh, on, on this topic, uh, there are a number of you who know a lot more than I do. And I'm trying to represent your interests and to learn from you as, as we go. And in this case, I had the, the opportunity to, um, to lead the passage of a pretty major piece of legislation in, in the House that I think is going to address, help us as a country address these problems for years to come, fingers crossed. Um, but I couldn't do it without the input that I get from, from all of you. I, I don't think... It, I don't think you can represent this congressional district if, if you're not willing to have these kinds of conversations and take questions and be held accountable. Now, I'm gonna keep on doing it uh, and, and hope that you guys uh, keep participating and, and tell your friends and bring them along because this is, this is what good citizenship in a democracy is all about. So thank you all uh, and I'll see you next time.